Hello. Um, it gives me enormous pleasure to be able to welcome you back to a Mansfield Public Talks for the first time in 18 months, um, and particular pleasure to um, have a talk which is our joint, our termly joint talk with the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights, and uh, especially for Black History Month, and finally, and um, very importantly as far as I'm concerned, that we have our wonderful new fellow, the uh, research director of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights, um, Taryn Kyton, to give uh, this talk. Um, Taryn is uh, the only one of my colleagues where I can say with any degree of authority that he really is a serious expert in his field. Everyone else looks very clever to me, and um, what they say is very interesting, but Taryn's field of law is my field of law, and so I know um, how important um, what he has to say is and how well-respected it is um, by practitioners as well as um, by academics. Um, Taryn um, is, as well as being the head of research at the Bonavero Institute, is the professor of public law uh, and legal theory at the Faculty of Law here in Oxford and a particular expert in legal theory, constitutional studies and discrimination law. And his um, major monograph, A Theory of Discrimination Law, uh, which came out um, in 2015, um, is a, a proper classic and has been cited by a number of courts, included the Israeli and Canadian um, Supreme Court, I think, the Canadian, uh, Indian Court a couple of times, and the European Court of Human Rights, um, although by a dissenting judge who was wrong, but the majority were right, and they too <laughs> could have cited Taron if they'd read it properly. Um, and he's also a very well-known um, speaker and teacher, um, and he's recently, I think in this week, um, been commended um, in the... Uh, of the um, Excellence, Excellence and Impact Awards, which are run jointly by Oxford University, um, the, Oxford, uh, the Open University, Reading, and Oxford Brooks. So we're really delighted to have you um, here, Taryn, and I know there are also people um, who will be following online later. So thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thank you very much, Helen, for that extremely kind introduction. Um, and for this invitation, it, I could not think of a better welcome to um, a new college than to get to know its members um, this way, by talking about my scholarship uh, on an issue that I know is, is close to the hearts of many of you who are here. So um, the topic of my talk today, marking the Black History Month, is the development of race in British law. And uh, I'll trace this history from a character you'll soon meet, if you don't know already, Baron Constantine, to our current context, defined in large part by Black Lives Matter across the pond. And you will see in my talk that that's not the only thing we have been influenced by from developments across the talk. But let me start on a more biographical note. I'm being told I was going to law school. I don't know how many lawyers are there in the audience today, but my uncle asked, why did the shark not eat the lawyer? I could sense a bad lawyer joke coming. <laughs> One of my firsts, but definitely not the last. Confirming my hunch, he told me out of professional courtesy. But today I'll tell you that sharks, and even lawyers, may sometimes have redeeming features. This is a story of British discrimination law, which for the most part has kept one step ahead of societal morality, controversially seeking to improve our moral compass on issues of discrimination generally, including on race discrimination. The law has without doubt been a handy tool to, de -leg to legitimize oppression colonialism, and racism in various guises. British India, for example, had different procedural and evidentiary rules for the trials of Europeans and Indians. And the Criminal Tribes Act of 1871 in British India led to several indigenous tribal and transgendered communities being declared criminal irrespective of individual guilt. More glaring examples of racial discrimination by law, by colonial law in particular, can no doubt be found in India 
and in other colonies. But this story, the story I'm going to tell you today, is a selective story of law's redemption. The story not of discrimination by law, but of the law against discrimination. Some of the earliest anti-discrimination laws are seen in the late 19th century, not in this country, but in the United States and in India. British law does not really begin to consider the problem of discrimination until significant numbers of non-white immigrants start arriving after the Second World War. In 1930, one Mr. Shah complained to the Home Office after being denied entry to a dance hall because he was Indian. As very much a once upon, the, once upon a time quick stepper myself, I can feel his pain. The Home Office, unfortunately, expressed its inability to help him. As this denial did not breach any law at that time. In the absence of such a law, imaginative lawyers used whatever instruments they could with greater or lesser success. One such early success came in 1943, very much during the war years, when the West Indian all-rounder Leary Constantine came to London to play a charity match at Lord's and booked rooms for himself and his family at the Imperial Hotel in Russell Square. Rather appropriate, since he was to play on a team representing the British Dominions against England 11. Despite being a famous cricketer, and subsequently, the first black peer. He was denied lodgings at the hotel. Supposedly, after US servicemen complained about his presence. There being no law in 1943 that outlawed race discrimination, creative lawyers, I'm sure very much like our principal here, used an ancient common law duty to sue the hotel. This duty was the duty that common law imposed on what was called common callers, a duty that required innkeepers, blacksmiths, prostitutes, laborers, to not refuse to serve for adequate compensation. So if they had the capacity, because they were common, as in public callers, they could not pick and choose between the king's subjects. They had to serve everyone. Interestingly, cooks were not common callers, because cooks were employed by households, and therefore the public could not make demands on their service. Anyway, this was a 17th century common law rule, which was used by Lord Constantine's lawyers, who won the case, and went on to write about his experiences of racism in the UK in a book called The Color Bar, published in 1954. But not all cases of race discrimination could be dealt with under the common law duty, which applied only to specific service providers and only for refusing to serve. The Notting Hill race riots in 1958 targeting Caribbean migrants, I've done something there that I shouldn't have done. There we go. Um, the Notting Hill race riots in 1958 targeting Caribbean migrants, and the Bristol bus boycott in 1963 in protest of the company's refusal to employ black or Asian staff 
drew attention to the urgent need for a bespoke law. The first law in the UK prohibiting racial discrimination was passed in 1965 called the Race Relations Act. As first steps often are, it was weak and tentative. It made overt discrimination on grounds of color, race, or ethnic or national origins a civil offense in places of public resort, like the hotel. By contrast, the US Civil Rights Act passed only a year previously applied not just to race, but to religion and sex as well. And it regulated not just public resorts, but also employers, schools, and other service providers. Although like the British statute, it was also focused only on what we now call direct discrimination, intentional discrimination. The 1965 law was amended very soon after it was enacted. Its inadequacies were recognized very quickly. The Race Relations Act of 1968, only three years later, made several important improvements to the 65 law. It defined discrimination as less favorable treatment. It expanded the sphere of prohibition of discrimination to employment, to trade unions, and to housing. It is important to remember that even as it enacts and strengthens race discrimination laws, and this is, by the way, the story I'm not focusing on today, but very much a footnote, the UK is almost simultaneously imposing serious and clearly racist curbs on immigration from the Commonwealth, for example, in the Commonwealth Immigration Immigrants Act of 1968. It is often forgotten that Enoch Powell's notorious Rivers of Blood remark was prefaced by a sideswipe at the Race Relations Bill of 1968. Now, this is where I wish I had the talent of doing convincing accents, but you'll have to use your imagination. And I quote, for these dangerous and divisive elements, the legislation proposed in the Race Relations Bill is the very pabulum they need to flourish. Here is the means of showing that the immigrant communities can organize to consolidate their members, to agitate and campaign against their fellow citizens and to overawe and dominate the rest of the rest with the legal weapons which the ignorant and the ill-informed have provided. As I look ahead, I am filled with foreboding. Like the Roman, I seem to see the river Tiber foaming with much blood, end of quote. I'm sure there are some dangerous and divisive elements in this room, too. At any rate, the anti-discrimination laws from the 60s provide requiring proof of discriminatory intent are now called first-generation laws. They were an important first step in establishing the wrongfulness and the injustice of using race to put people at a disadvantage. The move to second generation laws happens with the passage of the Race Relations Act of 1976. This milestone legislation dramatically improved the enforcement provisions in the previous two laws. It made the scope of the anti-discrimination provisions in employment, education, and provisions for goods and services much more comprehensive. Partnerships and vocational training bodies were bought within the ambit of the law. Public bodies, however, were still left out 
something that would not be rectified until near the end of the 20th century. The most important second generation innovation in the 1976 Act was the expansion of the scope of what counts as discrimination. Not only did it recognize the victimization of a complainant as discrimination, it also included a prohibition on indirect discrimination, or at least a prohibition if the defendant was unable to justify it, to show why they needed to discriminate indirectly for good reasons. Indirect discrimination means an unjustified, superficially neutral act that nonetheless has a disproportionate impact on a racial group. For the first time, the law moves away from any requirement of intentionality to show discrimination. What mattered was the impact of what you did. A good way to understand the concept is through Aesop's fable of the fox and the stork. Serving his guest the stork from a flat dinner plate wasn't very considerate hospitality on part of Mr. Fox. Now in the fable, if you know it, the stork drove the point home by returning the favor in the form of a long-necked pitcher. But real world storks, members of racial minorities and other disadvantaged groups, very rarely have the, time, the opportunity or the capacity to get even. This significant move away from the requirement to prove an intent to discriminate, and it remains very controversial to this date, and I'll tell you shortly how and why, but this move came about by almost a happy coincidence just before the draft bill for the Race Relations Act in 1976 was published, Roy Jenkins, the great reforming British Home Secretary then, was visiting the United States where he learned about the judgment of the US Supreme Court in a famous case called Griggs and Duke Power Company, decided in 1971. In the Griggs case, Duke Power Company, which by the way had a history of not employing black people, after the Civil Rights Act came into force in the US, had changed its employment policy from no blacks to graduates only. The impact, now this employment had nothing to do with educational requirements. It was unskilled job and never before had the company insisted on educational criteria for employment. What the claimants could not prove before the trial court was that the company had adopted this new policy with the intention to discriminate. And you, you can imagine how hard it is for claimants to prove something like intention of companies and boards, not only because of the information asymmetry, but because especially if you're trying to do something like this, you will make pretty sure that you don't leave a paper trail to prove that intention. Anyway, the fact of the matter was that the claimants could not establish intent to discriminate at trial. The case goes up to the US Supreme Court, which in 1971, in a landmark case, in a landmark judgment, decided that it did not matter. <clears throat> 
that the claimants could not prove intent, it held that if what the employer does has a disparate impact on a protected group, in this case a racial group, then unless they could show a business necessity for having that policy, it would be unlawful. Of course, Duke Power Company could not show business necessity in this case. In fact, they had operated pretty well hiring non-graduates until that point. And because of the minister's visit, the idea of disparate impact travels to the United Kingdom. Jenkins puts the idea in the race relations bill by translating it and calling it indirect discrimination. A brief footnote here, it's not a story I'm going to go into today, but the idea of indirect discrimination then travels from the UK to across the Commonwealth, to countries like Canada and South Africa and Hong Kong, and also to the European Union, which then absorbs it in its own laws and runs with it and then makes subsequent demands on British law to catch up. So anyway, it's a complex history, but Britain has played an extremely important role in, in exp well, first importing this important idea from the US and then exporting it to many other democracies around the world. This chance innovation was remarkable in many respects. As social morality caught up with the law, as racist became a really bad word, inviting extremely defensive reactions, cases of overt prejudicial discrimination started dying out or at any rate became very hard to prove. Strategic racists like the Duke Power Company re replaced their whites only rules with proxies like the graduates only rule in that case. The prohibition on indirect discrimination was the law's recognition that it was less interested in identifying and punishing a guilty party. This is not criminal law, this is civil law. And indirect discrimination liability almost never gives rise to damages. Usually all that the court does is declare that indirect discrimination has taken place and that it is unjustified. So the law's recognition was that it was less interested in identifying who was guilty and a lot more interested in reducing suffering of excluded groups. In my book, I had argued that the law adopted the point of view of those who experienced discrimination as they experienced discrimination, rather than the point of view of those who were alleged to have discriminated. In fact, by 1990, the House of Lords, in another famous case called James and Aisley Borough Council, was able to get rid of the need to prove discriminatory intent, even for direct discrimination cases. So all forms of discrimination were cast in terms of impact on the victim, whereas a discriminatory intent remained sufficient but no longer necessary to prove discrimination. This turn from impact, from intention to impact, I think is law's recognition that power can operate within institutions and societal structures without needing to be exercised by anybody. A phenomenon that Stephen Luke's calls subtle power or in the old Marxist tradition might be called hegemony. Indirect discrimination law is complex and underused. Judges in this country, as in the United States, have often sought to dilute its potential. An example of this attempted sabotage 
was the decision of the Court of Appeal in a case called Shafiq Esap and the Home Office in 2015. This is what happened. The Home Office administered a generic core skills assessment as a first step towards determining its staff's eligibility for promotion. It did not matter what job you did at the Home Office, whether you worked for its prison service or any other department or IT or whatever. Everybody had to set the same core skills assessment, which is a form of IQ test, um, bef and had to get a certain score before they would even be considered for promotion within the job. The Home Office's own internal equality audit showed that the selection rate under this assessment for non-white candidates was 40.3% of the rate for white candidates. It also showed that there was a 0.1% likely, likelihood that this disparity between white and non-white candidates was down to chance. So it was established to an extremely high degree of certainty and certainly to a degree that civil law requires, which is balance of probabilities, more likely to be true than not, that there was prima facie disparate impact. That, in other words, the, sorry, the promotion dice were loaded against the candidates. That should have been the point when the judge would have invited the Home Office to justify its policy. It was admitted by the Home Office. It was common ground that the policy was unjustifiable. The Home Office had conceded that there was little correlation between this assessment and the job that candidates actually did for the Home Office, just as in Griggs. At any rate, the Court of Appeal, remarkably in my view, found that the claimants had not discharged their burden of establishing a prima facie case because it wasn't enough to show that the law had a disparate impact. The, the, the policy of the assessment had a disparate impact. The Court of Appeal held they also needed to explain why it did so that the claimants, in short, had to explain to the court what it was about being black or Asian that resulted in their poor performance and that they weren't simply being lazy. Now, apart from the racial stereotypes that the judgment of the Court of Appeal is replete with, had the case been argued, well, at the trial level, this, or if the lawyers, in fact, even knew this was a burden they had to discharge, they probably could have pointed to the network effect of, uh, of knowing somebody who has worked in the home office before, your uncles and your parents or your siblings, um, the, the information capital, the social capital that first generation employees do not have, et cetera. So this wasn't perhaps entirely impossible, but it was a burden that in this case the employees could not discharge. And in an area where informational asymmetry between the parties is pervasive, shifting this explanatory burden from the employer to the employees would have effectively killed indirect discrimination claims except in the most obvious cases. It's hard enough to prove disparate impact in an additional burden to sociologically explain what was going on behind that disparate impact would have been a very heavy burden on claimants. Mercifully, the Supreme Court, you know, thank goodness for Lady Hale, <laughs> she's retired, so we don't know where the court will go, but anyway, in a judgment she wrote, uh, reversed the decision on appeal in 2017 and restored sanity and dignity 
to British law on indirect discrimination. Very similar and multiple judicial efforts to similarly eviscerate the law have happened across the pond uh, in a case called Watts Cove in 1991, in another case called Ricci. There have been a whole string of cases in the US that have chipped away at the liability of indirect discrimination or disparate impact. And there's a very strong chance that the new conservative majority on the Supreme Court is finally going to declare the prohibition on indirect discrimination or disparate impact in the United States itself to be unconstitutional. If you are taking bets, that's what I would put my money on. So ironically, the country where the idea was born is likely to soon kill it. The third big phase of legislative change in this area happens with the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, which found the Metropolitan Police to be institutionally racist. Following the McPherson report, an amendment to the Race Relations Act in the year 2000 further extended the prohibition on race discrimination finally to activities of public authorities and of the police. But it also recognized that merely prohibiting discrimination, direct and indirect, is not enough. That public institutional cultures will not change without the imposition of positive duties. But the form that these duties took were uniquely British. The amendment imposed, is, instead of substantive affirmative action duties that we see in the United States, or measures, they're not duties, voluntary measures usually in the US, the amendments imposed a new procedural duty on public authorities, a subject on which the principal has great expertise and has litigated many a case, which was a duty that required that public authorities in carrying out their functions, were now obliged to proactively give due regard to the need to eliminate racial discrimination and to promote equality of opportunity. This weak procedural duty was considered to be little more than a platitude when enacted, not at all par on par with the American style affirmative action but has since become a major point of litigation, and at least arguably seen as a key factor in mainstreaming equality concerns in public institutions. The story is a lot more complex, but I'll uh, not go into the complexity just here. I haven't recounted the parallel developments that were taking place on a number of fronts, on many other grounds, often on the instigation of the European Union, but all of this was brought together under an umbrella legislation in 2010 entitled the Equality Act. This was the Labour government's parting shot. It came at a time when the United States was already seeing a rollback of discrimination law by the judiciary in, at a time when a certain American billionaire was known mainly as a host on The Apprentice with a great number of enemies in Scotland, and Brexit was a far-fetched fantasy. But the 2010 Act was remarkable in not only comprehensively bringing all of these duties together, it gave a coherence to what was a patchwork of different pieces of anti-discrimination protections for different groups to different degrees in different areas of life. For the first time, it was possible to imagine anti-discrimination prohibitions at a, on a broad principled basis. The idea that the law was not protecting black people or women or LGBTQ people or persons with disabilities. The law was against the phenomenon of 
social groups suffering substantial, abiding, and pervasive disadvantage compared to their cognate groups, that women have for a very long time, perhaps always, in almost all sphere of human activity, and substantially been behind men in terms of advantage. And say, so you could adopt the idea, stop seeing the law as special interest group law, and accept that if social circumstances changed, so would the beneficiaries. I'll move towards concluding my lecture with highlighting three key challenges that remain in the field. There are many challenges, by the way. Right? Uh, we know a lot more today about the role of unconscious bias in human decision making. Algorithms are increasingly making key impactful decisions in all spheres of human activity and appear to be replicating societal structures of discrimination and disadvantage. Social media amplifies online hate in intense and targeted ways. In the aftermath of Black Lives Matter movement, government ministers, including our prime minister and the home secretary, appear to be weaponizing culture wars rather than trying to resolve them. The story since 2010, enactment of the Equality Act, has mostly been one of defending the gains in the face of successive governments hostile to the act, rather than building upon, further upon them. The first of these, the first, of, the first manifestations of this hostility, alongside the severe cuts to the budget of the Equality Commission, was the imposition in 2013 of a fee of 1,200 pounds on single claimants bringing claims of discrimination before the Employment Tribunal, rising to 7,200 pounds for claims brought by large groups. Until then, no fee was charged for bringing a discrimination claim. I've already told you that the law does not normally allow for the award of damages in indirect discrimination cases. In 2012 and in the year 2012-2013, 34% of the successful race discrimination cases resulted in an award of less than 3,000 pounds, and 52% were awarded less than 5,000 pounds. So if you compare the fee to what the claimant could possibly hope to get in the law, it wasn't surprising that the introduction of the fee in 2013 resulted in a drop of claims to an order of between 66 to 70 percent. The government managed to eviscerate the law through a simple procedural move without needing to bother with its substantive provisions. It was only in 2017, in the Unison case, that the Supreme Court found the fee order to be unlawful because it impeded access to justice and also because it discriminated indirectly against women. The second manifestation of, the, of several governments' hostility to the Equality Act concerns Section 1 of the Act. In its inaugural section, the Equality Act required all public authorities to, and I quote, have due regard to the desirability of exercising them in a way that is designed to reduce the inequalities of outcome which result from socio-economic disadvantage." End of quote. It's a procedural duty somewhat similar to, if weaker than, the procedural positive duties I just mentioned as the third generation change. The goal was to address a legitimate criticism of anti-discrimination laws that they had largely failed to take all left concerns with class-related deprivations. Instead of pitting 
black and Asian minorities against the white working classes, Section 1 sought a fellowship of the disadvantaged built upon that old-fashioned ideal of solidarity. Some of the culture wars waged by pitting race against class in a thoroughly cynical oppression Olympics that we have seen over the last few years might well have been avoided or at least mitigated had the political narrative been informed by an active Section 1 of the Equality Act. This was not to be. The Brown government lost power before it could bring the provision into force. So while the provision remained on the statute books, 11 years on, it is still inoperative in England. Scotland brought it into force only in 2018, and Wales in March earlier this year. So despite paying lip service to the project of leveling up, arguably the strongest legal tool available to government to move that agenda forward remains in abeyance in England. In fact, and this is the third worry, there are very good reasons to worry that further attacks on the Equality Act are very likely. In political battles, a strategically smart, if cynical, move is to exploit the ambiguity in a normative tool being employed against you and turn it on your opponents. Orban, Modi, Bolsonaro, and Trump, who diminished democracy by demonizing democratic institutions and claiming to be the sole representatives of the people, are cases on point. Similarly, the unfortunate use of the language of diversity in anti-discrimination campaigns initially employed by progressives to promote equality norms in businesses is now being turned on itself to undermine much of the gains. A recent paper written by a colleague of mine in the law faculty for a right-wing political think tank called Policy Exchange one that has the ear of the current government, demands significant carve-outs in the Equality Act to protect and promote diversity of political opinion. If translated into law, instead of rooting out racism, the Equality Act will mandate the protection of racist views and presumably actions based on those views in the name of protecting intellectual diversity. The proposal, like the diversity discourse, fails to appreciate the point of anti-discrimination law, which is to address substantial abiding and pervasive disadvantage between social groups. Because these advantage gaps reduce the ability of members of vulnerable groups to live successful lives. So British discrimination law is at crossroads. While clearly not perfect, the law has achieved quite a bit in the last half century. It is also under threat like never before. Whether it is incrementally and surreptitiously chipped away, or whether it lives to fight another day, remains to be seen. This battle, like those before it, is going to be as much political as legal. After all, Law has a complicated relationship with politics. While clearly not autonomous of power, law isn't simply a manifestation of power either. While it speaks the language of power, there is an inherent normativity to law's vocabulary. Even if that normativity is only power's self-seeking goal to legitimize itself, it brings in important constraints. And it creates and contains the potential for justice within law. It is this potential for justice that can be realized through a politics of solidarity. Let us remember that the 
most of the breakthroughs I've talked about today came through parliament, not through courts. So the question before us is this, right? Do we ultimately possess the imagination to forego a politics of competitive disadvantage? to not demand 100% agreement between us and fellow progressives before the possibility of coalitions can arise? Can we seek a fellowship of, disadvantage, of the disadvantaged, even as we acknowledge that not all suffering is the same? And by quoting Audrey Lord, who reminds us that there is no such thing as single issue struggle, even though in my talk I've talked only about race, I think it's important, you know, we don't live single issue lives. And ultimately it is recognizing the usness of them and the themness of us that there is any hope. So I'll stop on that note. Thank you very much for your patience.